it's really good to see each of you uh, here this afternoon. We want to go ahead and make a start. We'll come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Great God, most gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for this day. And we give thanks to you for the privilege that we have of meeting together in fellowship one with another, of listening to your word read and explained, and of spending time in prayer with and for one another. We thank you for evidences of your good hand upon us as a church, and we pray, O oh Heavenly Father, that you might continue with us, helping us to know and do your will. Now bless us as we meet together this afternoon and cause this time to be very beneficial and profitable to us all. Help us is our prayer in the name of our Savior. Amen. Amen. I'm almost sorry to see you close that door. That is one of the best sounds around. I kid you not. I hope you remember that uh, where no baby is crying, the church is dying. And probably um, the quietest place that we could go to today would be one of the local cemeteries uh, or uh, a mortuary. And so we're thankful uh, to hear uh, the sounds of life among us. So praise the Lord for that. Well, we're going to continue this afternoon thinking about seven truths for triumphant churches. And before we begin, I just want to remind you that this coming Tuesday, we will not have times of Bible study or prayer. But in a fortnight, we'll return on the 31st of August, and we will conclude our series uh, from Revelation 2 and 3 uh, by looking uh, at the last of these uh, seven uh, letters, the letter to the church in Laodicea. And so today uh, we're going to be looking uh, at the letter to the church in Philadelphia, and you'll see that uh, Philadelphia is roughly equidistant between Sardis and Laodicea, and you'll know that uh, Philadelphia uh, is the city of brotherly love. Uh, phileo uh, is that uh, love uh, that is shared among brothers. And we're going to see in the letter that one of the things that was most evident about them is not that they loved one another as significant as that was, but that they were loved of God. And so we're going to be looking uh, this afternoon uh, at uh, the first of these uh, letters, um, the letter to the church uh, in Philadelphia. So let's, uh, let's begin our reading just now. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming 
on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, before looking at uh, the outline for this afternoon's study, I want us to take just a moment and to uh, look again at some of the actual wording of this letter. Uh, this, uh, like the five uh, preceding letters, is addressed uh, to the angel. This is the uh, angelos. This is the messenger of the church in Philadelphia. It would seem that while uh, John was exiled on Patmos, that the churches would have sent uh, messengers to where John was, and they would have brought to him reports about the work in each of these seven places. And now these letters uh, appended to the larger revelation uh, have been sent uh, by the hand of these messengers to uh, each of these seven churches. Uh, you don't want to fall into the trap of thinking that the angel of the church in Philadelphia uh, is a reference to the pastor. Uh, the churches in the New Testament were led by plurality of elders, not by a single pastor. Even in Paul's time, when he was uh, leaving Asia Minor uh, on that last fateful trip to Jerusalem, he gathered the elders of the church uh, at Ephesus to where he was at Miletus. Well, this is uh, some years later, probably two, three decades later, and they would not have gone from a plurality of elders to a single pastor and that's just the church at Ephesus. So this would not be a reference to uh, the, the pastor, but to literally the messenger of the church in Philadelphia. Same word uh, is used, for instance, uh, regarding a man by the name of Epaphroditus, who was said to be uh, the messenger of the church in Philippi. He was the one, you know, who brought the love gift from the church at Philippi to Paul and then was the means through which the letter to the Philippians was returned to them. He was called their messenger, their angelos, uh, their angel. So this is to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. And it's good to know that this is indeed from uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Holy One. I love this description, the true one. He is the one who holds the key of David. He is the one uh, who opens, no one shuts, and shuts, and no one opens. This is indeed from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And as he said in all six letters, including this one, I know your works. Now to say I know your works is not necessarily a positive statement. Uh, in five of the seven, uh, there are positive, commendable things that he has to say about the churches. But the I know your works part of each letter is more general. He is saying uh, that he has exhaustive knowledge, comprehensive knowledge of, of who they are, of, of what they are, of, uh, of what they are doing uh, for his glory or not. 
And so uh, this is uh, an amazing statement. He says, I know your works. And then he asks them for the first of three times uh, in this letter to behold. He wants them to, to see something. He wants them to look upon something. The, the Greek word for behold is the word from which we derive our English word theater. And it's actually saying, take a step back, sit down, and look at the big picture. Behold what I am about to show you. And what an amazing thing it is that he's about to show the church at Philippi. This would be, I suppose, the sort of letter that all of us would desire for our church to receive. Now, that letter to the church uh, at, at Smyrna, the church, you know, that thought that they were poor when reality uh, was that they were rich. Well, that one wasn't too bad, uh, but this one is probably the best of them all. He says, I have set before you an open door. It's absolutely amazing because he's just said, well, I am the one who has, I misspoke a moment ago and said, I hold uh, he doesn't simply uh, hold the keys of David. He says, I have the keys of David. And he says, I open uh, things and they cannot be closed. And I close things and they cannot be opened. And I've set before you an open door. What an amazing thing to be a church of an open door, he says, which no one is able to shut amazing thing that the one who has the keys of David opens and no one can shut closes and no one can open and he says to the believers in Philadelphia I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut well to be a church of the open door must mean that they were a large church must mean that they were a, a strong church, must mean that they were a, a wealthy church because it's, you know, these big churches that have, you know, these open doors of opportunity in front of them. Well, listen to what he says. I know that you have but little power. He says, I know that you possess but little strength. I, I know that, that your uh, wealth uh, is limited, uh, your strength is limited, your wisdom is limited in the eyes of the world, your potential is limited, but I have set before you an open door which no one's able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and now he comes on to these words of commendation with which at least five of the seven letters begin, Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. And so here again is that important use of the word yet. Look at the seven letters. Just read them again and maybe circle or underscore every time you see the word yet. And it's very significant and telling indeed. He says, though you have little power, yet... And he commends them for these two things. You have kept my word. Isn't it wonderful to know that even in days of spiritual declension, isn't it wonderful to know that even in days of widespread spiritual decline and even in some places spiritual death, there are still those who have kept his word. And they have remained faithful to the Lord and to his word, come what may. You have but little power, but you have kept my word. This is why we operate a no-tolerance policy toward those who have an attitude of condescension toward small churches where maybe you only have uh, a handful of people who faithfully meet together under the ministry of God's word 
each week. Churches like that do not need criticism. They need encouragement. They don't need others to look down on them. They need others to seek to lift them up in prayer. It is something that is highly valued in the eyes of the Lord for a people with little power to use the remaining power that they have to hold fast to his word and to keep it. It'd be much easier for them to go the route of compromise. It would be much easier for them to say, well, we'll, you know, give a little bit here and give a little bit there. But he says, I know you. I know your works. Though you have little power, you have kept my word. And if you'll look forward in a moment, you're going to see that it's a specific word that they have kept. Because you have kept my word, do you notice, about patient endurance. And so that's why it's always important uh, just to read the scripture, but then to read it in the context in which it appears. So it's not just that they've kept his word generally, they had, but they had specifically kept his word about patient endurance. And so because of this, he says, I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world to try those uh, who dwell on the earth. I'm, I'm coming... Uh, soon, he says, hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. He says, you have kept my word. We see in a moment, it's his word about patient endurance. And you have not denied my name. Wonderful truth here about how they had not denied the name of the Lord. Now, there were temptations on every hand to do so. But yet they had been faithful in upholding the name of the Lord. And interesting, if, if you're reading this letter, how many times does he mention name? He says, now the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the New Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven, and my own new name. And so he, he is concerned with his name very, very highly. And they were a people there in Philadelphia. Though they had little strength, though they possessed little power, yet they had kept his word and had not denied his name. And in the sight of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is worthy of commendation. Now, through the years, I've been to uh, ministers' fraternals, uh, conferences, uh, conventions, you know, you name it. And one of the things that uh, ministers do when they meet up with one another, our church members do when they meet up with one another, is people want to know, well, you know, tell me about your church. How large is it? Uh, how big is it? How many people come along, you know, to the meetings? And uh, the, the reality is, how many times have you had a conversation like that and you've thought, uh, they've not asked me if we're keeping the word. They've not asked me if we are not denying his name. And we're so cynical that if someone said, well, we're seeking to keep faithful to God's word, uh, we're seeking, you know, not to deny his name. And the person's going to say, oh, they must be small. Because uh, if, if, if they were not small, they would be talking about their size and their strength of numbers. Well, the amazing thing here, and I, I trust you'll, you'll not only get this, but that this will get you, is that the opportunity comes not to the church with strength, of numbers. It, the opportunity comes not to the largest, wealthiest, most influential church. The opportunity, the open door, which no one is able to shut, is given to the church that keeps faithful to God's word and does not deny the name of the Lord. And so it's a wonderful promise indeed given uh, on, 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 the, on the basis of these 
uh, commendable traits that he says concerning them. Now, I've sort of, I've gone through this backward and forward. I hope that's not made anyone dizzy. But one of the things I've noticed is this. Uh, there is no word of condemnation about uh, the church at Philadelphia. I mean, I've looked for it. it, it it's, it's not there. Now, this didn't mean that the Philadelphia church was a perfect church, uh, because it wasn't. But it meant that there was nothing of particular note that the Lord Jesus would look upon and say, that needs correction. That's deserving of condemnation. So here's a church that was small in number, uh, limited in, in strength. But yet they're given great opportunity. And not only are they given great opportunity, they're actually given a great honor that the Lord looks upon them and says, I don't have a bad word to say about you. I don't have anything of a negative nature that needs to be corrected or put right. That's that's really encouraging. And so in those letters, we've tended to see Uh, some commendation, then words of condemnation and correction, and then we tend to come on to to counsel. He does give some counsel and advice about what they need to do uh, in light of their uh, situation, and and he he has a bit of this uh, for uh, the church here. Listen to this. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on earth. I am coming soon. And here's his first word of counsel to them. It's very explicit. Hold fast what you have. And what did they have? Well, they had this commitment to the word of God and they had this desire to uphold the name of God. And he says, Just keep doing what you're doing. Hold fast what you have. Don't desire to be like other churches. Hold fast to what you have. Don't long for the desires and opportunities that other fellowships have. Behold, have your eyes open to the opportunities that the Lord has opened to you. And this is one of the things... You know, we look at seven churches here uh, in this particular region of Asia Minor. Well, in modern-day Britain, uh, we have uh, some towns where there might be seven evangelical churches in, in one town. And those churches can sometimes all be essentially trying to do the same thing in the same way, and sometimes even copying or mimicking one another, or longing for the opportunities that the other church has, or envying uh, the, the openings that they have been given. We have to come to the place that we recognize that God has placed us where we are according to his good providence. He's given us our inherent strengths and weaknesses, He's determined what size we are, the scope of our ministry, and and what we should do is to seek to be faithful to his word and seek to uphold his name. And then whatever opportunities he gives us, it's not the time then for false humility and say, oh, maybe maybe they should do that or maybe some other fellowship ought to be uh, doing that. You know, if, if the Lord then gives us an opportunity, if he sets before us an open door, then we ought to readily uh, go through that door uh, for his glory. So this is holding fast what you have so that no one uh, may seize your crown. Now I want to get caught up with the outline there and just summarize here toward the end. We said there's a word of commendation. It's you have kept my word. Uh, You have not denied my name. We've said there is no word of condemnation. Praise the Lord for that. But there is a word of counsel, and the first one is hold fast. But I want you to notice a second one. You may have noted when I was speaking a moment ago, I said this one's very explicit, hold fast. Well, the next one is implicit, and it is go forward. 
Now, why would I say that this is the word of counsel uh, from the Lord to the church at Philadelphia? You, you don't see those words go forward explicitly stated in the text. Well, why would I say that they are implicit? When he says to them, Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one can shut. Do you not think that there is at least an implied, there is at least the permissible inference that he intends for them to go forward and to go through that door? This is one of the problems that sometimes uh, churches face and we need to hear and heed the counsel of the Lord is uh, some, sometimes we're going backward. Sometimes we're trying to pass through doors that were open to us maybe years ago or a generation ago or under different leadership or at a different time in the history of the church. And, and, and we sometimes think holding fast equates going backward. Because if you're going to hold fast to something, that, that means you know, you, you've got to go back or at least not move forward. Some people view these two as being sort of at odds with one another. How do you hold fast to something and go forward into other things at the same time? That's the challenge given to Philadelphia-like churches. Uh, Pastor Steve and I, along with our other elders and, and the deacons of the church, were all urging the church to go forward. No turning back, no turning back. We need to go forward. As we go forward, we must hold fast. Because if we do not hold fast to his word, and if we do not continue to honor his name, well, we can go forward in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of Christ, we're actually going back. We're actually in declension, which will ultimately result in death. So yes, we do need to go forward, but we need to hold fast. Holding fast whilst going forward. That's the counsel that he gives to us in days like these. And now, uh, very quickly, let's uh, come uh, to the conclusion. And uh, I know I've just been incorrigible uh, of late uh, in terms of the conclusion uh, that I've, I've just been plagiarizing, um, you know, other writers and uh, setting uh, the conclusion uh, before us. And, uh, you know, I, I did remember the old adage that the secret to originality is obscure sources. And so uh, I, I went all of the way back uh, to 2 Samuel and found uh, today's conclusion. It's lovely, I think. The Lord honors those who honor him. You know, uh, Eric Liddell, when he was competing uh, in the uh, Olympics, uh, would not uh, uh, compete on the Lord's Day. He's now going to be uh, running a race for which he had not trained, uh, a race which was twice as long uh, as he normally uh, ran. Uh, and you may remember uh, that uh, one of the other competitors on that day uh, wrote that verse uh, from Samuel uh, in a note, uh, the Lord honors those who honor him. And Liddell read it, and not only uh, read it, uh, but he uh, held it in his hand as he ran the race. How do I know? Well, I watched the chariots of fire. Whether or not he actually did it or not, I don't know. But in the movie, you know, he's holding in his hand the whole way. The Lord honors those who honor him. And he won the race going away, and he received the gold medal, and he's, he's still, and rightfully so, uh, a, a hero uh, in the eyes of many. Proof positive that the Lord honors those who honor him. I'll tell you the same thing that's true personally, maybe for an athlete as he runs his race. The same thing is true congregationally for a church that faithfully goes forward whilst at the same time holding fast to the word of God.
and to a desire to uphold the name of Christ. Many opportunities for compromise along the way, many. But we remember from a few weeks ago that today's compromise often means tomorrow's calamity. So as we go forward, let's hold fast and let's do so with this confidence that the Lord will honor those who honor him. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful to you for uh, the privilege and opportunity of meeting uh, together this uh, afternoon. Uh, we thank you for these uh, folk who have met with us, and we pray that you will have used the time of Bible study to uh, cultivate a deeper interest, uh, to pique our curiosity, to cause us to want to look further into these matters, uh, but most of all, that you will have caused uh, our spiritual appetites to be stimulated to desire to know more of your truth and to uh, have a greater resolve uh, to, yes, go forward, but at the same time to hold fast uh, to your word and to your name. Um, continue with us now as we come to you in prayer. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.